Some Experiences of an Irish R.M. by Somerville and Ross. Chapter One, Great Uncle McCarthy. A resident magistracy in Ireland is not an easy thing to come by nowadays. Neither is it a very attractive job. Yet on the evening when I first propounded the idea to the young lady who had recently consented to become Mrs. Sinclair Yates, it seemed glittering with possibilities. There was, on that occasion, a sunset and a string band playing the gondoliers, and there was also an ingenuous belief in the omnipotence of a godfather of Philippa's. Philippa was the young lady who had once been a member of the government. I was then climbing the steep ascent of the captains towards my majority. I have no fault to find with Philippa's godfather, he did all and more than even Philippa had expected. Nevertheless, I had attained to the dignity of Mud Major and had spent a good deal on postage stamps and on railway fares to interview people of influence before I found myself in the hotel at Skibborne, opening long envelopes addressed to Major Yates, R.M. My most immediate concern, as one who has spent nine weeks at Mrs. Raverty's hotel will readily believe, was to leave it at the earliest opportunity. But in those nine weeks, I had learned, amongst other painful things, a little, a very little, of the methods of the artisan in the west of Ireland. Finding a house had been easy enough. I had had my choice of several, each with some hundreds of acres of shooting, thoroughly poached, and a considerable portion of the roof intact. I had selected one, the one that had the largest extent of roof in proportion to the shooting, and had been assured by my landlord that in a fortnight or so it would be fit for occupation. There's a few little odd things to be done, he said easily. A lick of paint here and there, and a, a slap of plaster. I am short-sighted. I am also of Irish extraction. Both facts that make for toleration, but even I thought he was understating the case. So did the contractor. At the end of three weeks, the latter reported progress, which mainly consisted of the facts that the plumber had accused the carpenter of stealing sixteen feet of his inch pipe to run a bell wire through, and that the carpenter had replied that he wished the devil might run the plumber through a wren's quill. The plumber, having reflected upon the carpenter's parentage, the work of renovation had merged in battle, and at the next petty sessions I was reluctantly compelled to allot to each combatant seven days without the option of a fine. These and kindred difficulties extended in an unbroken chain through the summer months until a certain wet and windy day in October, when, with my baggage, I drove over to establish myself at Shri Lane. It was a tall, ugly house of three stories high, its walls faced with weather-beaten slates, its windows staring, narrow and vacant. Round the house ran an area in which grew some laurestinus and holly bushes among ash heaps and nettles, and broken bottles. I stood on the steps, waiting for the door to be opened, while the rain sluiced upon me from a broken eave shoot that had, amongst many other things, escaped the notice of my landlord. I thought of Philippa, and of her plan, broached in today's letter, of having the hall done up as a sitting room. The door opened and revealed the hall. It struck me that I had perhaps overestimated its possibility. Among them, I had certainly not included a flagged floor sweating with damp and a reek of cabbage from the adjacent kitchen stairs. A large elderly woman with a red face and a cap worn helmet-wise on her forehead swept me a magnificent curtsy as I crossed the threshold. Your honours, welcome she began, and then, 
Every door in the house slammed in obedience to the gust that drove through it, with something that sounded like, Men ye for a back door. Mrs. Cadogan abandoned her opening speech and made for the kitchen stairs. Improbable as it may appear, my housekeeper was called Cadogan, a name made locally possible by being pronounced Cadogan. Only those who have been through a similar experience can know what manner of afternoon I spent. I am a martyr to coals in the head, and I felt one coming on. I made a lager in front of the dining room fire with a tattered leather screen and the dinner table, and gradually, with cigarettes and strong tea, baffled the smell of must and cats and fervently trusted that the rain might avert a threatened visit from my landlord. I was then but superficially acquainted with Mr. Florence McCarthy Knox and his habits. At about 4.30, when the room had warmed up and my cold was yielding to treatment, Mrs. Cadogan entered and informed me that Mr. Flurry was in the yard and would be thankful if I'd go out to him, for he couldn't come in. Many are the privileges of the female sex. Had I been a woman, I should unhesitatingly have said that I had a cold in my head. Being a man, I huddled on a Macintosh and went out into the yard. My landlord was there on horseback, and with him there was a man standing at the head of a stout grey animal. I recognised with despair that I was about to be compelled to buy a horse. Good afternoon. Major, said Mr. Knox in his slow, sing-song brogue, it's rather soon to be paying you a visit, but I thought you might be in a hurry to see the horse I was telling you of. I could have laughed, as if I were ever in a hurry to see a horse. I thanked him and suggested that it was rather wet for horse dealing. Ah, it's nothing when you're used to it, replied Mr. Knox. His gloveless hands were red and wet. The rain ran down his nose, and his covered coat was soaked to a sodden brown. I thought that I did not want to become used to it. My relations with horses have been of a purely military character. I have endured the Sandhurst Riding School. I have galloped for an impetuous general. I have been steward at regimental races, but none of these feats have altered my opinion that the horse, as a means of locomotion, is obsolete. Nevertheless, the man who accepts a resident magistracy in the southwest of Ireland voluntarily retires into the prehistoric age to institute a stable became inevitable. You ought to throw a leg over him said Mr. Knox, and you're welcome to take him over a fence or two, if you like. He's a nice, uh, flippant jumper. Even to my unexacting eye, the grey horse did not seem to promise flippancy, nor did I at all desire to find that quality in him. I explained that I wanted something to drive, and not to ride. Well, that's a fine raking horse in harness, said Mr. Knox, looking at me with his serious grey eyes. And you'd drive him with a sop of hay in his mouth. Oh, bring him up here, Michael. Michael abandoned his efforts to kick the grey horse's forelegs into a becoming position and led him up to me. I regarded him from under my umbrella with quite unreasonable disfavour. He had the dreadful beauty of a horse in a toy shop as chubby, as wooden, and as conscientiously dappled. But it was unreasonable to urge this as an objection, and I was incapable of finding any more technical drawback. Yielding to a circumstance, I threw my leg over the brute, and after pacing gravely around the quadrangle that formed the yard, and jolting to my entrance gate and back, I decided that as he had neither fallen down nor kicked me off, it was worth paying twenty-five pounds for him, if only to get in out of the rain. Mr. Knox accompanied me into the house and had a drink. He was a fair, 
spare young man, who looked like a stable boy among gentlemen, and a gentleman among stable boys. He belonged to a clan that cropped up in every grade of society in the county, from Sir Valentine Knox of Castle Knox, down to the auctioneer Knox, who bore the attractive title of Larry the Liar. So far as I could judge, Florence McCarthy of that ilk occupied a shifting position about midway in the tribe. I had met him at dinner at Sir Valentine's. I had heard of him at an illicit auction held by Larry the Liar of brandy stolen from a wreck. They were black Protestants, all of them, in virtue of their descent from a godly soldier of Cromwell, and all were prepared at any moment of the day or night to sell a horse. You'll be apt to find this place a bit lonesome after the hotel, remarked Mr. Flurry sympathetically, as he placed his foot in its steaming boot on the hob. But it's a fine sound house anyway, and lots of rooms in it, though indeed, to tell you the truth, I never was through the whole of them since the time my great-uncle Dennis McCarthy died here. The dear knows I had enough of it that time. He paused and lit a cigarette, one of my best and quite thrown away upon him. Uh, those top floors now, he resumed, I wouldn't make too free with them. There's some of them would jump on you like a spring bed. Many's the night I was in and out of those attics, following my poor uncle when he had a bad turn on him. The horrors, you know. There were nights he never stopped walking through the house. Good Lord! Will I ever forget the morning he said he saw the devil coming up the avenue? Look at the two horns on him, says he, and he out with his gun and shot him. And be gad, it was his own donkey. Mr. Knox gave a couple of short laughs. He seldom laughed, having, in unusual perfection, the gravity of manner that was bred by horse-stealing, probably from the habitual repression of all emotion, save disparagement. The autumn evening, grey with rain, was darkening in the tall windows, and the wind was beginning to make bullying rushes among the shrubs in the area. A shower of soot rattled down the chimney, and fell on the hearth rug. More rain coming, said Mr. Knox, rising composedly. You'll have to put a goose down these chimneys some day soon. It's the only way in the world to clean them. Well, I'm for the road. You'll come out on the grey next week, I hope. Uh, the hounds will be meeting here. Uh, give a roar at him, coming in at his jumps. He threw his cigarette into the fire and extended a hand to me. Goodbye, Major. You'll see plenty of me and my hounds before you're done. Oh, there's a power of foxes in the plantations here. This was scarcely reassuring for a man who hoped to shoot woodcock, and I hinted as much. Oh, is it the cock? said Mr. Flurry. Believe me, there was never a woodcock yet that minded hounds now, no more than they'd mind rabbits. The best shoots ever I had here, the hounds were in it the day before. When Mr. Knox had gone, I began to picture myself going across country, roaring like a man on a fire engine, while Philippa put the goose down the chimney. But when I sat down to write to her, I did not feel equal to being humorous about it. I dilated ponderously on my cold, my hard work, and my loneliness, and eventually went to bed at ten o'clock full of cold shivers and hot whiskey and water. After a couple of hours of feverish dozing, I began to understand what had driven Great Uncle McCarthy to perambulate the house by night. Mrs. Cadogan had assured me that the Pope of Rome hadn't a better bed under him than myself, wasn't I down on the new flog mattress the old master bought in Father Scanlon's auction? By the smell, I recognized that flog meant flock. Otherwise, I should have said my couch was stuffed with old boots. I have seldom spent a more wretched night. The rain drummed with soft fingers on my window panes. The house was full of noises. 
I seem to see great uncle McCarthy ranging the passages with flurry at his heels. Several times I thought I heard him. Whisperings seemed borne on the wind through my keyhole. Boards creaked in the room overhead, and once I could have sworn that a hand passed, groping over the panels of my door. I am, I may admit, a believer in ghosts. I even take in a paper that deals with their culture. But I cannot pretend that on that night I looked forward to a manifestation of Great Uncle McCarthy with any enthusiasm. The morning broke stormily, and I woke to find Mrs. Cadogan's understudy, a grimy nephew of about eighteen, standing by my bedside with a black bottle in his hand. There's no bath in the house, sir, was his reply to my command. But uh, me aunt said, would you like a tagin? This alternative proved to be a glass of raw whiskey. I declined it. I look back to that first week of housekeeping at Tree Lane as to a comedy excessively badly staged and striped with lurid melodrama. Towards its close, I was positively homesick for Mrs. Ravertis, and I had not a single clean pair of boots. I am not one of those who hold the convention that in Ireland the rain never ceases day or night. But I must say that my first November at Tree Lane was composed of weather of which my friend Furry Knox remarked that you wouldn't meet a Christian out of doors unless it was a snipe or a dispensary doctor. To this lamentable category might be added a resident magistrate. Daily, shrouded in Mackintosh, I set forth for the petty sessions courts of my wide district. Daily, in the inevitable atmosphere of wet freeze and perjury, I listened to indictments of old women who plucked geese alive, of publicans whose hospitality to their friends broke forth uncontrollably on Sunday afternoons, of parties who, in the language of the police sergeant, were subtly defined as, not to say drunk, but in good fighting trim. I got used to it all in time, I suppose one can get used to anything. I even became careless to the surprises of Mrs. Cadogan's cooking. As the weather hardened and the woodcock came in and one by one I discovered and nailed up the rat holes, I began to find life endurable and even to feel some remote sensation of homecoming when the grey horse turned in at the gate of Sri Lane. The one feature of my establishment to which I could not become inured was the pervading sub-presence of something or things which, for my own convenience, I summarized as Great Uncle McCarthy. There were nights on which I was certain that I heard the inebriate shuffle of his foot overhead, the touch of his fumbling hand against the walls. There were dark times before the dawn when sounds went to and fro the moving of weights, the creaking of doors, a faraway rapping in which was a workmanlike suggestion of the undertaker, a rumble of wheels on the avenue. Once I was impelled to the perhaps imprudent measure of cross-examining Mrs. Cadogan. Mrs. Cadogan, taking the preliminary precaution of crossing herself, asked me faithfully what day of the week it was. Friday, she repeated after me. F Friday? Oh, the Lord save us. It was a Friday. The old master was buried. At this point, a saucepan opportunely boiled over, and Mrs. Cadogan fled with it to the scullery and was seen no more. In the process of time, I brought Great Uncle McCarthy down to a fine point. On Friday nights, he made coffins and drove hearses. During the rest of the week, he rarely did more than patter and shuffle in the attics over my head. One night, about the middle of December, I awoke, suddenly aware that some noise had fallen like a heavy stone into my dreams. As I felt for the matches, it came again, the long, grudging groan 
and the uncompromising bang of the cross door at the head of the kitchen stairs. I told myself that it was a draught that had done it, but it was a perfectly still night. Even as I listened, a sound of wheels on the avenue shook the stillness. The thing was getting past a joke. In a few minutes, I was stealthily groping my way down my own staircase with a box of matches in my hand, enforced by scientific curiosity, but nonetheless armed with a stick. I stood in the dark at the top of the back stairs and listened. The snores of Mrs. Cadogan and her nephew Peter rose tranquilly from their respective lairs. I descended to the kitchen and lit a candle. There was nothing unusual there, except a great portion of the Cadogan wearing apparel, which was arranged at the fire and was being serenaded by two crickets. Whatever had opened the door, my household was blameless. The kitchen was not attractive, yet I felt indisposed to leave it. Nonetheless, it appeared to be my duty to inspect the yard. I put the candle on the table and went forth into the outer darkness. Not a sound was to be heard. The night was very cold and so dark that I could scarcely distinguish the roofs of the stables against the sky. The house loomed tall and oppressive above me. I was conscious of how lonely it stood in the dumb and barren country. Spirits were certainly futile creatures, childish in their manifestations, stupidly content with the old machinery of raps and rumbles. I thought, how fine a scene might be played on a stage like this. If I were a ghost, how bluely I would glimmer at the windows, how whimperingly chatter in the wind. Something whirled out of the darkness above me and fell with a flop on the ground just at my feet. I jumped backwards. In point of fact, I made for the kitchen door and, with my hand on the latch, stood still and waited. Nothing further happened. The thing that lay there did not stir. I struck a match. The moment of tension turned to bathos as the light flickered on nothing more fateful than a dead crow. Dead it certainly was. I could have told that without looking at it, but why should it, at some considerable period after its death, fall from the clouds at my feet? But did it fall from the clouds? I struck another match and stared up at the impenetrable face of the house. There was no hint of solution in the dark windows but I determined to go up and search the rooms that gave upon the yard. How cold it was. I can feel now the frozen, musty air of those attics with their rat-eaten floors and wallpapers furred with damp. I went softly from one to another, feeling like a burglar in my own house, and found nothing in elucidation of the mystery. Windows were hermetically shut and sealed with cobwebs. There was no furniture, except in the end room, where a wardrobe without doors stood in a corner, empty, save for the solemn presence of a monstrous tall hat. I went back to bed, cursing those powers of darkness that had got me out of it, and heard no more. My landlord had not failed of his promise to visit my coverts with his hands. In fact, he fulfilled it rather more conscientiously than seemed to me quite wholesome for the cock-shooting. I maintained a silence which I felt to be magnanimous on the part of a man who cared nothing for hunting and a great deal for shooting, and wished the hounds more success in the slaughter of my foxes than seemed to be granted to them. I met them all one red frosty evening as I drove down the long hill to my domain gates, Flurry at their head in his shabby pink coat and dingy breeches, the hounds trailing dejectedly behind him and his half-dozen companions. What luck! I called out, drawing rein as I met them. None, said Mr. Flurry briefly. He did not stop, neither did he remove his pipe from the down-twisted corner of his mouth. 
His eye at me was cold and sour. The other members of the hunt passed me with equal hauteur. I thought they took their ill luck very badly. On foot, among the last of the straggling hounds, cracking a carman's whip and swearing comprehensively at them all, slouched my friend Slipper. Our friendship had begun in court, the relative positions of the dock and the judgment seat forming no obstacle to its progress, and had been cemented during several days tramping after Snipe. He was, as usual, a little drunk, and he hailed me as though I were a ship. Ahoy, Major Yates, he shouted, bringing himself up with a lurch against my cart. It's hunting you should be in place of sending poor devils to jail. But I hear you had no hunting, I said. You heard that, did ye? <laughs> Slipper rolled upon me an eye like that of a profligate pug. Well, begar, you heard no more than the truth. But where are all the foxes? said I. Begar, I don't know no more than your honour, and uh, Sri Lane that there used to be as many foxes in it as there's crosses in a yard to check. Well, well, I'll say nothing for it, only that it's queer. Here, Venus, Negress. Slipper uttered a yell, horse with whiskey, in adjuration of two elderly ladies of the pack who had profited by our conversation to stray away into an adjacent cottage. Well, good night, Major. And Mr. Flurry's as cross as briars, and he'll have me yet. He set off at a surprisingly steady run, cracking his whip and whooping like a madman. I hope that when I am his age, I shall be able to run like Slipper. That frosty evening was followed by three others like unto it, and a flight of woodcock came in. I calculated that I could do with five guns. I had dispatched invitations to shoot and dine on the following day to four of the local sportsmen, among whom was, of course, my landlord. I remember that in my letter to the latter, I expressed a facetious hope that my bag of cock would be more successful than his of foxes had been. The answers to my invitations were not what I expected. All without so much as a conventional regret, declined my invitation. Mr. Knox added that he hoped the bag of cock would be to my liking, and that I need not be afraid that the hounds would trouble my coverts any more. Here was war. I gazed in stupefaction at the crooked scrawl in which my landlord had declared it. It was wholly and entirely inexplicable, and instead of going to sleep comfortably over the fire and my newspaper, as a gentleman should, I spent the evening in irritated ponderings over this bewildering and exasperating change of front on the part of my friendly squireens. My shoot the next day was scarcely a success. I shot the woods in company with my gamekeeper, Tim Connor a gentleman whose duties mainly consisted in limiting the poaching privileges to his personal friends. And whatever my offence might have been, Mr. Knox could have wished me no bitterer punishment than hearing the unavailing shouts of Mark Cock and seeing my birds winging their way from the coverts far out of shot. Tim Connor and I got ten couple between us, it might have been thirty if my neighbours had not boycotted me, for what I could only suppose was the slackness of their hands. I was dog-tired that night, having walked enough for three men, and I slept the deep, insatiable sleep that I had earned. It was somewhere about three a.m., that I was gradually awakened by a continuous knocking, interspersed with muffled calls, Great Uncle McCarthy had never before given tongue, and I freed one ear from blankets to listen. Then I remembered that Peter had told me the sweep had promised to arrive that morning and to arrive early. Blind with sleep and fury, I went to the passage window and thence desired the sweep to go to the devil. It availed me little. For the remainder of the night I could hear him pacing round the house, 
trying the windows, banging at the doors, and calling upon Peter Cadogan as the priests of Baal called upon their god. At six o'clock I had fallen into a troubled doze when Mrs. Cadogan knocked at my door and imparted the information that the sweep had arrived. My answer need not be recorded, but in spite of it, the door opened and my housekeeper, in a weird déshabillé, effectively lighted by the orange beams of her candle, entered my room. God forgive me. I've never seen one I hate as much as that sweep, she began. He's these three hours, I don't know what three hours, no, but all night, raising tallywhack and tandem round the house to get at the chimbleys. Well, for heaven's sake, let him get at the chimneys and let me go to sleep, I answered, goaded to desperation. And you may tell him from me that if I hear his voice again, I'll shoot him. Mrs. Cadogan silently left my bedside, and as she closed the door, she said to herself, The Lord save us. Subsequent events may be briefly summarized. At 7.30... I was wakened anew by a thunderous sound in the chimney, and a brick crashed into the fireplace, followed at a short interval by two dead jackdaws and their nests. At eight, I was informed by Peter that there was no hot water, and he wished the devil would roast the same sweep. At nine-thirty, when I came down to breakfast, there was no fire anywhere, and my coffee made in the coach house tasted of soot. I put on an overcoat and opened my letters. About fourth or fifth in the uninteresting heap came one in an egregiously disguised hand. Sir, it began, this is to inform you your unsportsmanlike conduct has been discovered. You have been suspected this good while of shooting the Sri Lane foxes. It is now now you do worse. Parties have seen your gamekeeper going regular to meet the Saturday early train at Salters Hill Station with your grey horse under a cart and your labels on the boxes, and we know as well as your agent and cork what it is you have in those boxes. Be warned in time. Your well-wisher. I read this through twice before its drift became apparent, and I realized that I was accused of improving my shooting and my finances by the simple expedient of selling my foxes. That is to say, I was in a worse position than if I had stolen a horse or murdered Mrs. Cadogan or got drunk three times a week in Scabon. For a few moments, I fell into wild laughter and then, aware that it was rather a bad business to let a lie of this kind get a start, I sat down to demolish the preposterous charge in a letter to Flurry Knox. Somehow, as I selected my sentences, it was borne in upon me that if the letter spoke the truth, circumstantial evidence was rather against me. Mere lofty repudiation would be unavailing, and by my infernal facetiousness about the woodcock, I had effectively filled in the case against myself. At all events, the first thing to do was to establish a basis and have it out with Tim Connor. I rang the bell. Peter, is Tim Connor about the place? He is not, sir. I heard him say he was going west the hill to mend the bounds fence. Peter's face was covered with soot, his eyes were red, and he coughed ostentatiously. The sweeps, after breaking one of his brushes within in your bedroom chimney, sir, he went on with all the satisfaction of his class in announcing domestic calamity. He's above on the roof now, and he'd be thankful to you to go up to him. I followed him upstairs in that state of simmering patience that any employer of Irish labour must know, and sympathize with. I climbed the rickety ladder and squeezed through the dirty trapdoor, involved in the ascent to the roof, and was confronted by the hideous face of the sweep, black against the frosty blue sky. He had encamped with all his paraphernalia on the flat top of the roof, 
and was good enough to rise and put his pipe in his pocket on my arrival. Good morning, Major. That's a grand view you have up here, said the sweep. He was evidently far too well-bred to talk shop. I travelled every roof in this country, and there isn't one where he get as handsome a prospect. Theoretically, he was right. But I had not come up to the roof to discuss scenery, and demanded brutally why he had sent for me. The explanation involved a recital of the special genius required to sweep the Sri Lane chimneys, of the fact that the sweep had in infancy been sent up and down every one of them by great uncle McCarthy, of the three ass loads of soot that by his peculiar skill he had this morning taken from the kitchen chimney, of its present purity, the draught being such that it would draw up a young cat with it. Finally, realising that I could endure no more, he explained that my bedroom chimney had got what he called a wind in it, and he proposed to climb down a little way in the stack to try would he get to come at the brush. The sweep was very small, the chimney very large. I stipulated that he should have a rope round his waist, and, despite the illegality, I let him go. He went down like a monkey, digging his toes and fingers into the niches made for the purpose in the old chimney. Peter held the rope. I lit a cigarette and waited. Certainly the view from the roof was worth coming up to look at. It was rough, heathery country on one side, with a string of little blue lakes running like a turquoise necklet round the base of a furry hill, and patches of pale green pasture were set amidst the rocks and heather. A silvery flash behind the undulations of the hills told where the Atlantic lay in immense plains of sunlight. I turned to survey with an owner's eye my own grey woods and straggling plantations of larch, and spied a man coming out of the western wood. He had something on his back, and he was walking very fast. A rabbit poacher, no doubt. As he passed out of sight into the back avenue, he was beginning to run. At the same instant, I saw on the hill beyond my western boundaries half a dozen horsemen scrambling by zigzag ways down towards the wood. There was one red coat among them, it came first, at the gap in the fence that Tim Connor had gone out to mend, and with the others was lost sight in the covert, from which in another instant came clearly through the frosty air a shout of, Gone to ground! Tremendous horn blowings followed. Then, all in the same moment, I saw the hounds break in full cry from the wood and come stringing over the grass and up the black avenue towards the yard gate. Were they running a fresh fox? into the stables. I do not profess to be a hunting man, but I am an Irishman, and so, it is perhaps superfluous to state, is Peter. We forgot the sweep as if he had never existed and precipitated ourselves down the ladder, down the stairs, and out into the yard. One side of the yard is formed by the coach house and a long stable, with a range of lofts above them, planned on the heroic scale in such matters, that obtained in Ireland formerly. These joined the house at the corner by the back door. A long flight of stone steps leads to the lofts, and up these, as Peter and I emerged from the back door, the hounds were struggling helter-skelter. Almost simultaneously, there was a confused clatter of hoofs in the back avenue, and Flurry Knox came stooping at a gallop under the archway, followed by three or four other riders. They flung themselves on their horses and made for the steps of the loft. More hounds pressed, yelling on their heels. The din was indescribable and justified Mrs. Cadogan's subsequent remark that when she heard the noise she thought was the end of the world and the devil collecting his own. I jostled in the wake of the party and found myself in the loft, wading in hay and nearly deafened by the clamour that was bandied about the high roof and walls. At the farther end of the loft, the hounds were raging in the hay, encouraged thereto by the hoops and screeches of Flurry and his friends. High up in the gable of the loft, where it joined the main wall of the house, there was a small door. And I noted with a transient surprise that there was a long ladder leading up to it. 
even as it caught my eye, a hound fought his way out of a drift of hay and began to jump at the ladder, throwing his tongue vociferously and even clamouring up a few rungs in his excitement. "'Tis the way he's gone,' roared Surrey, striving through hounds and hay towards the ladder. "'Trumpeter has him. What's up there back at the door, Major? I don't remember it at all.' My crimes had evidently been forgotten in the supremacy of the moment. While I was futilely asserting that had the fox gone up the ladder, he could not possibly have opened the door and shut it after him, even if the door led anywhere, which, to the best of my belief, it did not, the door in question opened, and to my amazement, the sweep appeared at it. He gesticulated violently, and over the tumult was heard to asseverate that there was nothing above there, only a way into the flue, and anyone would be destroyed with the soot. Ah, go to blaze with your soot, interrupted Furry, already halfway up the ladder. I followed him, the other men pressing up behind me. That trumpeter had made no mistake was instantly brought home to our noses by the reek of fox that met us at the door. Instead of a chimney, we found ourselves in a dilapidated bedroom full of people. Tim Connor was there. The sweep was there, and a squalid elderly man and woman on whom I had never set eyes before. There was a large open fireplace, black with the soot the sweep had brought down with him, and on the table stood a bottle of my own special Scotch whisky. In one corner of the room was a pile of broken packing cases, and besides these on the floor lay a bag in which something kicked. Flurry, looking more uncomfortable and nonplussed than I could have believed possible, listened in silence to the ceaseless harangue of the elderly woman. The hounds are yelling like lost spirits in the loft below, but her voice pierced the uproar like a bagpipe. It was an unspeakably vulgar voice, yet it was not the voice of a countrywoman and there were frowsy remnants of respectability about her general aspect. And is it you, Flurry Knox, that's calling me a disgrace? <laughs> disgrace indeed am I. Me, that was your poor mother's own uncle's daughter, and as good a McCarthy as ever stood in Sri Lane. What followed I could not comprehend, owing to the fact that the sweep kept up a perpetual undercurrent of explanation to me as how he had got down the wrong chimney. I noticed that his breath stank of whiskey. Scotch, not the native variety. Never, as long as Flurry Knox lives to blow a horn, will he hear the last of the day that he ran his mother's first cousin to ground in the attic. Never, while Mrs. Cadogan can hold a basting spoon, will she cease to recount how, on the same occasion, she plucked and roasted ten couple of woodcock in one torrid hour to provide luncheon for the hunt. In the glory of this achievement, her confederacy with the stowaways in the attic is wholly slurred over in much the same manner as the startling outburst of summonses for trespass brought by Tim Carr during the remainder of the shooting season obscured the unfortunate episode of the bagged fox. It was, of course, zeal for my shooting that induced him to assist Mr. Knox's disreputable relations in the deportation of my foxes, and I have allowed it to remain at that. In fact, the only things not allowed to remain were Mr. and Mrs. McCarthy Gannon. They, as my landlord informed me, in the midst of vast apologies, had been permitted to squat at Sri Lane until my tenancy began, and having then ostentatiously and abusively left the house, they had, with the connivance of the Kedagons, secretly returned to roost in the corner attic to sell foxes under the aegis of my name and to make inroads on my belongings. They retain connection with the outer world by means of the ladder and the loft, and, with the house in general, and my whisky in particular, 
by a door into the other attics, a door concealed by the wardrobe in which reposed great uncle McCarthy's tall hat. It is with the greatest regret that I relinquish the prospect of writing a monograph on great uncle McCarthy for a spiritualistic journal. But with the departure of his relations, he ceased to manifest himself, and neither the nailing up of packing cases nor the rumble of the cart that took them to the station disturbed my sleep for the future. I understand that the task of clearing out the McCarthy Gannon's effects was of a nature that necessitated two glasses of whiskey per man. And if the remnants of rabbit and jackdaw disinterred in the process were anything like the crow that was thrown out of the window at my feet, I do not grudge the restorative. As Mrs. Cadogan remarked to the sweep, a Turk couldn't stand it. Chapter 2 In the Curran Hilti Country it is hardly credible that I should have been induced to depart from my usual walk of life by a creature so uninspiring as the grey horse that I bought from Flurry Knox for twenty-five pounds. Perhaps it was the monotony of being questioned by every other person with whom I had five minutes' conversation as to when I was coming out with the hounds, and being further informed that in the days when Captain Brown, the late Coast Guard officer, had owned the Grey, there was not a fence between this and Mallow big enough to please them. At all events, there came an epoch-making day when I mounted the Quaker and presented myself at a meet of Mr. Knox's hounds. It is my belief that six out of every dozen people who go out hunting are disagreeably conscious of a nervous system, and two out of the six are in what is brutally called a blue funk. I was not in a blue funk, but I was conscious not only of a nervous system, but of the anatomical fact that I possessed large, round legs, handsome in their way, even admirable in their proper sphere, but singularly ill-adapted for adhering to the slippery surfaces of a saddle. By a fatal intervention of providence, the sport, on this my first day in the hunting field, was such as I could have enjoyed from a bath chair. The hunting field was on this occasion a relative term, implying long stretches of unfenced moorland and bog, anything in fact, save a field. The hunt itself might also have been termed a relative one, being mainly composed of Mr. Knox's relations in all degrees of cousinhood. It was a day when frost and sunshine combined went to one's head like ice champagne. The distant sea looked like the Mediterranean, and for four sunny hours, the Knox relatives and I followed nine couple of hounds at a tranquil foot pace along the hills, our progress mildly enlivened by one or two scrambles in the shape of jumps. At three o'clock I jogged home, and felt within me the newborn desire to brag to Peter Cadogan of the Quaker's doings, as I dismounted, rather stiffly, in my own yard. I little thought that the result would be that three weeks later I should find myself in a railway carriage at an early hour of a December morning, in company with Flurry Knox and four or five of his clan, journeying towards an unknown town named Romcurran, with an appropriate number of horses in boxes behind us, and a van full of hounds in front. Mr. Knox's hounds were on their way by invitation to have a day in the country of their neighbours, the Curran Hilti Harriers, and with amazing fatuity, I had allowed myself to be cajoled into joining the party. A northerly shower was striking in long spikes from the glass of the window. The atmosphere of the carriage was blue with tobacco smoke, and my feet, in a pair of new butcher boots, had sunk into a species of arctic sleep. 
Well, you got my letter about the dance at the hotel tonight, said Ferry Knox, breaking off a whispered conversation with his amateur whip, Dr. Jerome Hickey, and sitting down beside me. And we are to go out to the Harriers today, and uh, they have a sure fox for our hounds tomorrow. I'll tell you, you'll have the best fun you ever had. It's a great country to ride. Fine, honest banks that you can come racing at anywhere you like. Dr. Hickey, a saturnine young man with a long nose and a black torpedo beard, returned to his pocket the lancet with which he had been trimming his nails. They're like the Tipperary banks, he said. You climb down nine feet and you fall the rest. It occurred to me that the Quaker and I would most probably fall all the way, but I said nothing. I hear Tomsey Flood has a good horse this season, resumed Flurry. Then it's not the one you sold him, said the doctor. <laughs> I'll take my oath it's not, said Flurry with a grin. I believe he has it in for me still over that one. Dr. Jerome's moustache went up under his nose and showed his white teeth. Small blame to him, when you sold him a mare that was wrong of both her hind legs. Do you know what he did, Major Yates? The mare was lame going into the fair, and he took the two hind shoes off her and told poor Flood she kicked them off in the box, and that was why she was going tender. And he was so drunk, he believed him. The conversation here deepened into trackless obscurities of horse-dealing. I took out my stylograph pen and finished a letter to Philippa with a feeling that would probably be my last. The next step in the day's enjoyment consisted in trotting in cavalcade through the streets of Drumcurran with another northerly shower descending upon us, the mud splashing in my face and my feet coming torturingly to life. Every man and boy in the town ran with us. The Harriers were somewhere in the tumult ahead, and the Quaker began to pull and hump his back ominously. I arrived at the meet considerably heated, and found myself one of some thirty or forty riders who, with traps and bicycles and foot people, were jammed in a narrow, muddy road. We were late, and a move was immediately made across a series of grass fields, all considerately furnished with gates. There was a glacial gleam of sunshine, and people began to turn down the collars of their coats. As they spread over the field, I observed that Mr. Knox was no longer riding with old Captain Hancock, the master of the Harriers, but had attached himself to a square-shouldered young lady with effective coils of dark hair and a grey habit. She was riding a fidgety black mare with great decision and a not disagreeable swagger. It was at about this moment that the hounds began to run, fast and silently, and everyone began to canter. This is nothing at all, said Dr. Hickey, thundering alongside of me on a huge young chestnut. There might have been a hare here last week, or a red herring this morning. I wouldn't care if we only got what it warm us. For the matter of that, I'd sooner hunt a cat as a hare, I was already getting quite enough to warm me. The Quaker's respectable grey head had twice disappeared between his forelegs in a brace of most unsettling bucks, and all my experiences at the riding school at Santos did not prepare me for the sensation of jumping a briery wall with a heavy drop into a lane so narrow that each horse had to turn at right angles as he landed. I did not so turn, but save myself from entire disgrace by a timely clutch at the mane. We scrambled out of the lane over a pile of stones and furze bushes, and at the end of the next field were confronted by a tall, stone-faced bank. Everyone, always excepting myself, was riding with that furious valour which is so conspicuous when neighbouring hunts meet, and the leading half-dozen charged the obstacle at steeplechase speed. I caught a glimpse of the young lady in the grey habit, sitting square and strong as her mare topped the bank, with Flurry and the redoubtable Mr. Thompson Flood riding on either hand. 
I followed in their wake with a blind confidence in the Quaker and none at all in myself. He refused it. I suppose it was in token of affection and gratitude that I fell upon his neck. At all events, I had reason to respect his judgment as, before I had recovered myself, the hounds were straggling back into the field by a gap lower down. It finally appeared that the hounds could do no more with the line they had been hunting, and we proceeded to jog interminably, I knew not whither. During this unpleasant process, Furry Knox bestowed on me many items of information, chiefly as to the pangs of jealousy he was inflicting on Mr. Flood by his attentions to the lady in the grey habit, Miss Bobby Bennett. She'll have all Hancock's money one of these days. She's his niece, you know. And she's as good a girl to ride, uh, but she's not as young as she was ten years ago. You'd be looking at a chicken for a long time <laughs> before you thought of her. She might take Tomsey some day, if she can't do any better. He stopped and looked at me with a gleam in his eye. Uh, come on, and I'll introduce you to her. Before, however, this privilege could be mine, the whole cavalcade was stopped by a series of distant yells, which apparently conveyed information to the hunt though to me they only suggested a red Indian scalping his enemy. The yells travelled rapidly nearer, and a young man with a scarlet face and a long stick sprang upon the fence and explained that he and Patsy Laurie were after chasing a hare two miles down out of the hill above, and near a dog not a one with them but themselves, and she was lying beat out under a bush, and Patsy Laurie was minding her until the hounds would come. I had a vision of a humane Patsy Lorry fanning the hair with his hat, but apparently uh, nobody else found the fact unusual. The hounds were hurried into the fields, the hare was again spurred into action, and I was again confronted with the responsibilities of the chase. After the first five minutes I had discovered several facts about the Quaker. If the bank was above a certain height, he refused it irrevocably. If it accorded with his ideas, he got his forelegs over and ploughed through the rest of it on his stifle joints. Or, if a gripe made this inexpedient, he remained poised on top till the fabric crumbled under his weight. In the case of walls, he butted them down with his knees or squandered them with his hind legs. These operations took time, and the leaders of the hunt streamed farther and farther away over the crest of a hill, while the Quaker pursued at the equable gallop of a horse in the bayou tapestry. I began to perceive that I had been adopted as a pioneer by a small band of followers who, as one of their number candidly explained, liked to have someone ahead of them to uh, soften the banks, and accordingly, waited respectfully till the Quaker had made the rough places smooth and taken the raw edge off the walls. They, in their turn, showed me alternative routes when the obstacle proved above the Quaker's limit. Thus, in ignoble confederacy, I and the offscourings of the Carnhilty hunt pursued our way across some four miles of country. When at length we parted, it was with extreme regret on both sides. A river crossed our course, with boggy banks pitted deep with the hoof marks of our forerunners. I suggested it to the Quaker and discovered that nature had not in vain endued him with the hindquarters of the hippopotamus. I presume the others had jumped it. The Quaker, with abysmal flounderings, walked through and heaved himself to safety on the farther bank. It was the dividing of the ways. My friendly company turned aside as one man, and I was left with the world before me and no guide save the hoof marks in the grass. These presently led me to a road on the other side of which was a bank that was at once added to the Quaker's blacklist. The rain had again begun to fall heavily, 
and was soaking in about my elbows. I suddenly asked myself why in heaven's name I should go any farther. No adequate reason occurred to me, and I turned, in what I believed to be, the direction of Drumcurran. I rode on for possibly two or three miles without seeing a human being until, from the top of a hill, I decried a solitary lady rider. I started in pursuit. The rain kept blurring my eyeglass, but it seemed to me that the rider was a schoolgirl with hair hanging down her back and that her horse was a trifle lame. I pressed on to ask my way and discovered that I had been privileged to overtake no less a person than Miss Bobby Bennett. My question as to the route led to information of a varied character. Miss Bennett was going that way herself. Her mare had given her what she called a toss and a half, whereby she had strained her arm and the mare her shoulder. Her habit had been torn and she had lost all her hairpins. I'm an awful object, she concluded. My hair's the plague of my life out hunting. I declare I wish to goodness I was bald. I struggled to the level of the occasion with an appropriate protest. She had really very brilliant grey eyes, and her complexion was undeniable. Philippa has since explained to me uh, that it is a mere male fallacy that any woman can look well with her hair down her back. But I have always maintained that Miss Bobby Bennett, with the rain glistening on her dark tresses, looked uncommonly well. I shall never get a drive for the dance tonight, she complained. I, I wish I could help you, said I. Perhaps you've got a hairpin or two about you, said she with a dance that had certainly done great execution before now. I disclaimed the possession of any such tokens, but volunteered to go and look for some at a neighbouring cottage. The cottage door was shut, and my knockings were answered by a stupefied-looking elderly man. Conscious of my own absurdity, I asked him if he had any hairpins. I didn't see a hair... This week, he responded in a slow bellow. Hair pins, I roared. Has your wife any hair pins? She has not. Then, as an afterthought, she's dead these ten years. At this point, a young woman emerged from the cottage and, with many coy grins, plucked from her own head some half-dozen hairpins, crooked and grey with age, but still hairpins, and as such, well worth my shilling. I returned with my spoil to Miss Bennet, only to be confronted with a fresh difficulty. The arm that she had strained was too stiff to raise to her head. Miss Bobby turned her handsome eyes upon me. It's no use she said plaintively. I can't do it. I looked up and down the road. There was no one in sight. I offered to do it for her. Miss Bennet's hair was long, thick and soft. It was also slippery with rain. I twisted it conscientiously, as if it were a hay rope, until Miss Bennet with an irrepressible shriek, told me it would break off. I coiled the rope with some success and proceeded to nail it to her head with the hairpins. At all the most critical points, one, if not both, of the horses moved. Hairpins were driven home into Miss Bennet's skull and were, with difficulty, plucked forth again. In fact, a more harrowing performance can hardly be imagined. But Miss Bennet bore it with the heroism of a pincushion. I was putting the finishing touches to the coiffure when some sounds made me look round, and I beheld at a distance of some fifty yards the entire hunt, 
approaching us at a foot pace. I lost my head and, instead of continuing my task, I dropped the last hairpin as if it were red hot and kicked the Quaker away to the far side of the road, thus, if it were possible, giving the position away a shade more generously. There were fifteen riders in the group that overtook us, and fourteen of them, including the whip, were grinning from ear to ear. The fifteenth was Mr. Thompson Flood, and he showed no sign of appreciation. He shoved his horse past me and up to Miss Bennett, his red moustache bristling, truculence in every outline of his heavy shoulders. His green coat was muddy and his hat had a cave in it. Things had apparently gone ill with him. Flurry's witticisms held out for about two miles and a half. I do not give them because they were not amusing, but they all dealt ultimately with the animosity that I, in common with himself, uh, should henceforth have to fear from Mr. Flood. Oh, he's a holy terror, he said conclusively. He was riding the tails off the hounds today to best me. He was near killing me twice. Uh, we had some words about it, I can tell you. I very near took my whip to him. Such a bull rider of a fellow I never saw. He wouldn't so much as stop to catch Bobby Bennett's horse when I picked her up. He was riding so jealous. His own girl, mind you. And such a crumpler as she got, too. I declare, she knocked a groan out of the road when she struck it. She doesn't seem so much hurt. I said, hurt, said Flurry, flicking casually at a hand. <laughs> you couldn't hurt that one unless you took a hatchet to her. The rain had reached the pitch that put further hunting out of the question, and we bumped home at that intolerable place known as Hound's Jog. I spent the remainder of the afternoon over a fire in my bedroom in the Royal Hotel Drumcurran. Official letters to write, having mercifully provided me with an excuse for seclusion, while the bar and the billiard room hum below, and the Quaker's three-cornered gallop wreaked its inevitable revenge upon my person. As this process continued, and I became proportionately embittered, I asked myself, not for the first time, what Philippa would say when introduced to my present circle of acquaintances. I have already mentioned that a dance was to take place at the hotel, given, as far as I could gather, by the leading lights of the Carnhilty Hunt. A less jocund guest than the wreck who at the pastoral hour of nine crept stiffly down to chase the glowing hours with flying feet could hardly have been encountered. The dance was held in the coffee room, and a conspicuous object outside the door was a saucer bath full of something that looked like flour. Rub your feet in that, said Furry. That's French chalk. They hadn't time to do the floor, so they hit on this dodge. I complied with this encouraging direction and followed him into the room. Dancing had already begun, and the first sight that met my eyes was Miss Bennett in a yellow dress, waltzing with Mr. Thompson Flood. She looked very handsome, and in spite of her accident, she was getting round the sticky floor and her still more sticky partner with the swing of a racing cutter. Her eye caught mine immediately and with confidence. Clearly, our acquaintance that in the space of twenty minutes had blossomed tropically into hairdressing, was not to be allowed to wither. Nor was I myself allowed to wither. Men, known and unknown, plied me with partners till my shirt cuff was black with names, and the number of dancers stretched away into the blue distance of tomorrow morning. The music was supplied by the organist of the church, who played with religious unction and at the pace of a processional hymn. I put forth into the melee with a junior Bennett, inferior in calibre to Miss Bobby, but a strong goer, and, I fear, made but a sorry debut in the eyes of Drumcurran. 
At every other moment I bumped into the unforeseen orbits of those who reversed and of those who walked their partners backwards down the room with faces of ineffable supremacy. Being unskilled in these intricacies of an elder civilization, the younger Miss Bennet fared but ingloriously at my hands. The music pounded interminably on until the heel of Mr. Flood uh, put a period to our sufferings. The nasty, dirty, filthy brute, shrieked the younger Miss Bennet in a single breath. He's torn the gown off my back. She whirled me to the cloakroom. We parted, mutually unregretted at its door, and by, I fear, common consent, evaded our second dance together. Many, many times during the evening, I asked myself why I did not go to bed. Perhaps it was the remembrance that my bed was situated some ten feet above the piano in a direct line. But whatever was the reason, the night wore on and found me still working my way down my shirt cuff. I sat out as much as possible and found my partners to be, as a body, pretty, talkative and ill-dressed. And during the evening... I had many and varied opportunities of observing the rapid progress of Mr. Knox's flirtation with Miss Bobby Bennett. From number four to number eight, they were invisible. That they were behind a screen in the commercial room might be inferred from Mr. Flood's thundercloud presence in the passage outside. At number nine, the young lady emerged for one of her dances with me. It was a barn dance, and particularly trying to my momently stiffening muscles. But Miss Bobby, whether in dancing or sitting out, went in for the rigour of the game. She was in as hard condition as one of her uncle's hands, and for a full fifteen minutes I capered and swooped beside her, larding the lean earth as I went, and replying but spasmodically to her even flow of conversation. "'That'll take the stiffness out of you,' she exclaimed, "'as the organist slowed down reverentially to a conclusion. "'I had a bet with Furry Knox over that dance. "'He said you weren't up to my weight at the pace.' "'I led her forth to the refreshment table "'and was watching with awe her fearless consumption of claret cup "'that I would not have touched for a sovereign when Florrie with a partner on his arm, strolled past us. "'Well, you won the gloves, Miss Bobby,' he said. "'Don't you wish you may get em? "'Gloves without the G, Mr. Knox,' replied Miss Bennet, in a voice loud enough to reach the end of the passage where Mr. Thomas Flood was burying his nose in a very brown whiskey and soda. "'Your hair's coming down.' retorted Furry. Ask Major Yates if he can spare you a few hairpins. Swifter than lightning, Miss Bennet hurled a macaroon at a retreating foe, missed him, and subsided laughing onto a sofa. I mopped my brow and took my seat beside her, wondering how much longer I could live up to the social exigencies of Drum Curran. Miss Bennet, however, proved excellent company. She told me artfully and inch by inch all that Mr. Flood had said to her on the subject of my hairdressing. She admitted that she had, as a punishment, cut him out of three dances and given them to Flurry Knox. When I remarked that, in fairness, they should have been given to me, she darted a very attractive glance at me and pertinently observed that I had not asked for them as steals the dawn into a fevered room and says, Be of good cheer, the day is born. So did the rumour of supper pass among the chaperones, male and female. It was obviously due to a sense of the fitness of things that Mrs. Bennet was apportioned to me, and I found myself in the gratifying position of heading with her the procession to supper. My impressions of Mrs. Bennet are few but salient. She wore an apple-green satin dress and filled it tightly, wisely mistrusting the hotel supper. 
she had imported sandwiches and cake in a pocket handkerchief, and, warmed by two glasses of sherry, she made me the recipient of the remarkable confidence that she had but two back teeth in her head. But, thank God, they met. When, with the other starving men, I fell upon the remains of the feast, I regretted that I had declined her offer of a sandwich. Of the remainder of the evening, I am unable to give a detailed account. Let it not for one instant be imagined that I had looked upon the wine of the Royal Hotel when it was red, or indeed any other colour. As a matter of fact, I had spied an inconspicuous corner in the entrance hall, and there I first smoked a cigarette and subsequently sank into uneasy sleep. Through my dreams, I was aware of the measured pounding of the piano, of the clatter of glasses at the bar, of wheels in the street, and then more clearly, of Flurry's voice assuring Miss Bennet that if she'd only wait for another dance, he'd get the R.M. out of bed to do her hair for her. Then again, oblivion. At some later period, I was dropping down a chasm on the Quaker's back and landing with a shock. I was twisting his mane into a chignon when he turned around his head and caught my arm in his teeth. I awoke with a dew of terror on my forehead to find Miss Bennet leaning over me in a scarlet cloak with a hood over her head and shaking me by my coat sleeve. Major Yates, she began at once in a hurried whisper. I want you to find Flurry Knox and tell him there's a plan to feed his hounds at six o'clock this morning so as to spoil their hunting. How do you know? I asked, jumping up. My little brother told me. He came in with us tonight to see the dance, and he was hanging round in the stables, and he heard one of the men telling another there was a dead mule in an outhouse in Bride's Alley, all cut up, ready to give to Mr. Knox's hounds. But why shouldn't they get it? I asked in sleepy stupidity. Is it fill them up with an old mule? Just before they're going out hunting, flashed Miss Bennet. Hurry and tell Mr. Knox, don't let Tomsey Flood see you telling him or anyone else. Oh, then, it's Mr. Flood's game, I said, grasping the situation at length. It is, said Miss Bennet, suddenly turning scarlet. He's a disgrace. I'm ashamed of him. I'm done with him. I resisted a strong disposition to shake Miss Bennet by the hand. I can't wait, she continued. I made my mother drive back a mile. She doesn't know a thing about it. I said I'd left my purse in the cloakroom. Good night. Don't tell a soul but Flurry. She was off, and upon my incapable shoulder rested the responsibility of the enterprise. It was past four o'clock, and the last bars of the last waltz were being played. At the bar, a knot of men with flurry in their midst were tossing odd man out for a bottle of champagne. Flurry was not in the least drunk, a circumstance worthy of remark in his present company, and I got him out into the hall and unfolded my tidings. The light of battle lit in his eye as he listened. I knew by Tomsey he was shaping for mischief, he said coolly. He's taken as much liquor as a stiffener tinker, and he's only half drunk this minute. Hold on till I get Jerome Hickey and Charlie Knox. They are sober. I'll be back in a minute. I was not present at the Council of War, thus hurriedly convened. I was merely informed when they returned that we were all to... Hurry on. My best evening pumps have never recovered subsequent proceedings. They, with my swelled and aching feet inside them, were raced down one filthy lane after another until somewhere on the outskirts of Drumcurran, Flurry pushed open the gate of a yard and went in. It was nearly five o'clock on that raw December morning. 
Low down in the sky, a hazy moon shed a diffused light. All the surrounding houses were still and dark. At our footsteps, an angry bark or two came from inside the stable. Whisht, said Furry. I'll say a word to them before I open the door. At his voice, a chorus of hysterical welcome arose. Without more delay, he flung open the stable door, and instantly we were all knee-deep in a rush of hounds. There was not a moment lost. Flurry started at a quick run out of the yard, with the whole pack pattering at his heels. Charlie Knox vanished. Dr. Hickey and I followed the hounds, splashing into puddles and hobbling over patches of broken stones, till we left the town behind and hedges arose on either hand. Here's the house, said Furry, stopping short at a low entrance gate. Many's the time I've been here when his father had it. It'll be a queer thing if I can't find a window I can manage. And the old cook he has is as deaf as the dead. He and Dr. Hickey went in at the gate with the hounds. I hesitated ignobly in the mud. This isn't an R.M.'s job, said Flurry in a whisper, closing the gate in my face. You'd best keep clear of housebreaking. I accepted his advice, but I may admit that before I turned for home, a sash was gently raised. A light had sprung up in one of the lower windows, and I heard Furry's voice saying, Over, 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 to his hands. There seemed to me to be no interval at all between these events and the moment when I woke in bright sunlight to find Dr. Hickey standing by my bedside in a red coat with a tall glass in his hand. It's nine o'clock, he said. I'm just after waking Furry Knox. There wasn't one stirring in the hotel till I went down and pulled the boots from under the kitchen table. It's well for us, the meat's in the town. And by the by, your grey horse has four legs on him the size of bolsters this morning. He won't be fit to go out, I'm afraid. Drink this anyway. You're in the want of it. Dr. Hickey's eyelids were rather pink, but his hand was as steady as a rock. The whiskey and soda was singularly untempting. What happened last night? I asked eagerly as I gulped it. Oh, it all went very nicely, thank you, said Hickey, twisting his black beard to a point. We benched as many of the hounds in Flood's bed as it fit, and we shut the lot into the room. We had them just comfortable when we heard his latch key below at the door. He broke off and began to snigger. Well, I said, sitting bolt upright. Well, he got in at last, and he lit a candle then. That took him five minutes. He was pretty tight. We were looking at him over the banisters until he started to come up. And according as he came up, we went on up the top flight. He stood admiring his candle for a while on the landing, and we wondered he didn't hear the hounds snuffing under the door. He opened it then, and on the minute, three of them bolted out between his legs. Dr. Hickey again paused to indulge in Mephistophelian laughter. Well, you know, he went on, when a man in poor Tomsey's condition sees six dogs jumping out of his bed, <laughs> he's apt to make a wrong diagnosis. He gave a roar and pitched the candlestick at them and ran for his life downstairs and all the hounds after him. Gone away, screeches that devil flurry, pelting downstairs on top of them in the dark. I believe I screeched too. Good heavens, I gasped. I was well out of that. Well, you were, admitted the doctor. However, Tomsey bested them in the dark, and he got to ground in the pantry. I heard the cups and saucers go as he slammed the door on the hounds' noses, and the minute he was in, Flurry turned the key on him. 
They are real dogs. Come see my buck, says Furry, just to quiet him. And there we left him. Was he hurt? I asked, conscious of the triviality of the question. <laughs> well, he lost his brush, replied Dr. Hickey. Old Merrylegs tore the coat tails off him. We got them on the floor when we struck a light. Flurry has them to nail on his kennel door. Charlie Knox had a pleasant time, too, he went on. With the man that brought the barrel load of meat to the stable, we picked out the tastiest bits and arranged them round Flood's breakfast table for him. <laughs> they smelt very nice. <laughs> well, I'm delaying you with my talking. Flory's hounds had the run of the season that day. I saw it admirably throughout, from Miss Bennet's pony cart. She drove extremely well, in spite of her strained arm. Chapter 3 Trinket's Colt It was Petty Sessions Day in Skibon, a cold grey day of February. A case of trespass had dragged its burden of cross summonses and cross swearing far into the afternoon, and when I left the bench, my head was singing from the bellowings of the attorneys, and the smell of their clients was heavy upon my palate. The streets still testified to the fact that it was market day, and I evaded with difficulty the sinuous course of carts full of suddenly screwed people, and steered an equally devious one for myself among the groups anchored round the doors of the public houses. Skibon possesses among its legion of public houses one establishment which timorously and almost imperceptibly proffers tea to the thirsty. I turned in there, as was my custom on court days, and found the little dingy den known as the ladies' coffee room in the occupancy of my friend Mr. Florence McCarthy Knox, who was drinking strong tea and eating buns with serious simplicity. It was a first and quite unexpected glimpse of that domesticity that has now become a marked feature in his character. You're the very man I wanted to see, I said as I sat down beside him at the old cloth covered table. A man I know in England, who is not much of a judge of character, has asked me to buy him a four-year-old down here, and as I should rather be stuck by a friend than a dealer, I wish you'd take over the job. Flory poured himself out another cup of tea and dropped three lumps of sugar into it in silence. Finally, he said, There isn't a four-year-old in this country that I'd be seen dead with at a pig fair. This was discouraging from the premier authority on horseflesh in the district. But it isn't six weeks since you told me you had the finest filly in your stables that was ever foaled in the county cork, I protested. What's wrong with her? Oh, is it that filly? said Mr. Knox with a lenient smile. Oh, she's gone this three weeks from me. I swapped her on six pounds for a three-year-old ironmonger colt, and after that I swapped the colt on nineteen pounds for that abandoned horse I rode last week at your place, and after that again I sold the abandoned horse for seventy-five pounds to old Wepley, and I had to give him back a couple of sovereigns luck money. You see, I did pretty well with the filly after all. Yes, yes, no, rather, I assented, as one dizzily accepts the propositions of a bimetallist. And you don't know of anything else? The room in which you were seated was closely screened from the shop by a door with a muslin curtain window in it. Several of the panes were broken, and at this juncture two voices uh, that had for some time carried on a discussion forced themselves upon our attention. Begging your pardon for contradicting you, ma'am, said the voice of Mrs. MacDonald, proprietress of the tea shop, and a leading light in Skibon dissenting circles. 
shrilly tremulous with indignation. If the servants I recommend you won't stop with you, it's no fault of mine. If respectable young girls are set picking grass out of your gravel in place of their proper work, certainly they will give warning. The voice that replied struck me as being a notable one, well-bred and imperious. When I take a barefooted slut out of a cabin, I don't expect her to dictate to me what her duties are. Sorry, jerked up his chin in a noiseless laugh. It's my grandmother, he whispered. I bet you Mrs. MacDonald don't get much change out of her. If I set her to clean the pigsty, I expect her to obey me, continued the voice in accents that would have made me clean forty pigsties had she desired me to do so. Very well, ma'am, retorted Mrs. MacDonald. If that's the way you treat your servants, you needn't come here again looking for them. I consider your conduct as neither that of a lady nor a Christian. Don't you indeed, replied Flurry's grandmother. Well, your opinion doesn't greatly distress me, for, to tell you the truth, I don't think you're much of a judge. Didn't I tell you she'd score? murmured Flurry, who was by this time applying his eye to a hole in the muslin curtain. She's off. He went on, returning to his tea. She's a great character. She's 83 if she's a day, and she's as sound on her legs as a three-year-old. Did you see that old Shandryden of hers in the street a while ago? And a fellow on the box with a red beard on him like Robinson Crusoe. That old mare that was on the near side, Trinket, her name is, is mighty near clean bread. I can tell you, her foals are worth a bit of money. I had heard of old Mrs. Knox of Ossalas. Indeed, I had seldom dined out in the neighborhood without hearing some new story of her and her remarkable menage. But it had not yet been my privilege to meet her. Well, now, went on Flurry in his slow voice, I'll tell you a thing that's just come into my head. My grandmother... Uh, promised me a fall of trinkets the day I was one and twenty, and that's five years ago. And deuce the one I've got from her yet. Uh, you never were at Arcelas? No, you were not. Well, I'll tell you, the place there is like a circus with horses. She has a couple of score of them running wild in the woods, like deer. Oh, come, I said. <laughs> I'm a bit of a liar myself. Well, she has a dozen of them anyhow. Rattling good colts, too, some of them. But they might as well be donkeys, for all the good they are to me or anyone. It's not once in three years she sells one. And there she has them, walking after her for bits of sugar, like a lot of dirty lapdogs. And it furry with disgust. Well, what's your plan? Do you want me to make her a bid for one of the lapdogs? I was thinking, replied Flurry, with great deliberation, that my birthday's this week, and maybe I could work a four-year-old coat of trinkets she has out of her in honor of the occasion. And sell your grandmother's birthday present to me? Just that, I suppose answered Flurry with a slow wink. A few days afterwards, a letter from Mr. Knox informed me that he had squared the old lady and it would be all right about the colt. He further told me that Mrs. Knox had been good enough to offer me with him a day's snipe shooting on the celebrated Arcelas bogs and he proposed to drive me there the following Monday, if convenient. Most people found it convenient to shoot the Ocelas snipe bog when they got the chance. Eight o'clock on the following Monday morning saw Flurry, myself, and a groom packed into a dog cart with portmantles, gun cases, and two rampant red setters. It was a long drive, twelve miles at least, and a very cold one. We passed through long tracts of pasture country, fought for Flurry, 
with memories of runs which were recorded for me fence by fence, in every one of which the biggest dog fox in the country had gone to ground, with not two feet, measured accurately on the handle of the whip, between him and the leading hound through bogs that imperceptibly melted into lakes, and finally down and down into a valley where the fir trees of Ocelas clustered darkly round a glittering lake and all but hid the grey roofs and pointed gables of Ocelas Castle. There's a nice stretch of a domain for you, remarked Flurry, pointing downwards with a whip, and one little old woman holding it all in the heel of her fist. Well able to hold it she is too, and always was, and she lived twenty years yet, if it's only to spite the whole lot of us, and when all's said and done, goodness knows how she'll leave it. It strikes me uh, you were lucky to keep her up to her promise about the colt, I said. Flory administered a composing kick to the ceaseless strivings of the red setters under the seat. I uh, used to be rather a pet with her he said after a pause. But mind you, I haven't got him yet. And if she gets any notion I want to sell him, I'll never get him. So uh, say nothing about the business to her. The tall gates of Ocelas shrieked on their hinges as they admitted us and shut with a clang behind us in the faces of an old mare and a couple of young horses who, foiled in their break for the excitements of the outer world, turned and galloped defiantly on either side of us. Flory's admirable cob hammered on, regardless of all things save his duty. He's the only one I have that I trust myself here with, said his master, flicking him approvingly with the whip. There are plenty of people afraid to come here at all. And when my grandmother goes out driving, she has a boy on the box with a basket full of stones to peg at them. Talk of the dickens. Here she is herself. A short, upright old woman was approaching, preceded by a white woolly dog with sore eyes and a bark like a tin trumpet. We both got out of the trap and advanced to meet the lady of the manor. I may summarise her attire by saying that she looked as if she had robbed a scarecrow. Her face was small and incongruously refined. The skinny hand that she extended to me had the grubby tan that bespoke the professional gardener and was decorated with a magnificent diamond ring. On her head was a massive purple velvet bonnet. I am very glad to meet you, Major Yates, she said with an old-fashioned precision of utterance. Your grandfather was a dancing partner of mine in the old days at the castle, when he was a handsome young aide-de-camp there, and I was... <laughs> you may judge for yourself what I was. She ended with a startling little hoot of laughter, and I was aware that she quite realised the world's opinion of her and was indifferent to it. Our way to the bogs took us across Mrs. Knox's home farm and through a large field in which several young horses were grazing. There now, that's my fellow, said Flurry, pointing to a fine-looking colt, the chestnut with the white diamond on his forehead. He'll run into three figures before he's done, but we'll not tell that to the old lady. The famous Ocelas bogs were as full of snipe as usual, and a good deal fuller of water than any bogs I had ever shot before. I was on my day, and Flurry was not, and as he is ordinarily an infinitely better snipe shot than I, I felt at peace with the world and all men as we walked back wet through at five o'clock. The sunset had waned and a big white moon was making the eastern tower of Ocelas look like a thing in a fairy tale or a play when we arrived at the hall door. An individual, whom I recognised as the Robinson Crusoe coachman, admitted us to a hall the like of which one does not often see. The walls were panelled with dark oak up to the gallery that ran round three sides of it. 
The balusters of the wide staircase were heavily carved, and blackened portraits of Fleury's ancestors on the spindle side stared sourly down on their descendant as he tramped upstairs with the bog mould on his hobnailed boots. We had just changed into dry clothes when Robinson Crusoe shoved his red beard round the corner of the door with the information that the mistress said we were to stay for dinner. My heart sank. It was then barely half past five. I said something about having no evening clothes and having to get home early. Sure, the dinner will be in another half hour, said Robinson Crusoe, joining hospitably in the conversation. And as for evening clothes, God bless you. The door closed behind them. Uh, never mind, said Furry. I dare say you'll be glad enough to eat another dinner by the time you get home. He laughed. Poor Slipper, he added inconsequently, and only laughed again when I asked for an explanation. Old Mrs. Knox received us in the library, where she was seated by a roaring turf fire which lit the room a good deal more effectively than the pair of candles that stood beside her in tall silver candlesticks. Ceaseless and implacable growls from under her chair indicated the presence of the woolly dog. She talked with confounding culture of the books that rolls all round her to the ceiling. Her evening dress was accomplished by means of an additional white shawl, rather dirtier than its congeners. As I took her in to dinner, she quoted Virgil to me, and in the same breath, screeched an abjuration at a being whose matted head rose suddenly into view from behind an ancient Chinese screen, as I have seen the head of a Zulu woman peer over a bush. Dinner was as incongruous as everything else. Detestable soup in a splendid old silver tureen that was nearly as dark in hue as Robinson Crusoe's thumb. A perfect salmon, perfectly cooked, on a chipped kitchen dish, such cut glass as is not easy to find nowadays. Sherry that, as Flurry subsequently remarked, would burn the shell off an egg. And a bottle of port, draped in immemorial cobwebs, warm with age and probably priceless. Throughout the vicissitudes of the meal, Mrs. Knox's conversation flowed on undismayed. Directed sometimes at me, she had installed me in the position of friend of her youth and talked to me as if I were my own grandfather, sometimes at Crusoe, with whom she had several heated arguments, and sometimes she would make a statement of remarkable frankness on the subject of her horse-farming affairs to Flurry, who, very much on his best behaviour, agreed with all she said and risked no original remark. As I listened to them both, I remembered with infinite amusement how he had told me once that a pet name she had for him was Tony Lumpkin, and no one but herself knew what she meant by it. It seemed strange that she made no allusion to Trinket's coat or to Flurry's birthday, but, uh, mindful of my instructions, I held my peace. As, at about half-past eight, we drove away in the moonlight, Flurry congratulated me solemnly on my success with his grandmother. He was good enough to tell me that she would marry me tomorrow if I asked her, and he wished I would, even if it was only to see what a nice grandson he'd be for me. A sympathetic giggle behind me told me that Michael on the back seat had heard and relished the jest. We had left the gates of Ocelas about half a mile behind when, at the corner of a by-road, Flurry pulled up. A short, squat figure arose from the black shadow of a furze bush and came out into the moonlight, swinging its arms like a cabman and cursing audibly. Oh, murder! Oh, murder, Mr. Flurry! What kept you at all? Twould perish the crows to be waiting here the way I am these two hours. Ah, shut your mouth, slipper, said Flurry who, to my surprise, had turned back the rug and was taking off his driving coat. I couldn't help it. Come on, Yates. We've got to get out of here. 
What for? I asked in not unnatural bewilderment. It's all right. I'll tell you as we go along, replied my companion, who was already turning to follow Slipper up the by-road. Take the trap on, Michael, and uh, wait at the river's cross. He waited for me to come up with him and then put his hand on my arm. You see, Major, this is the way it is. My grandmother's given me that colt right enough, but if I waited for her to send him over to me, I'd never see a hair of his tail. So I just thought that as we were over here, uh, we might as well take him back with us, and maybe he'll give us a help with him. He'll not be altogether too handy for a first go off. I was staggered. An infant in arms could scarcely have failed to discern the fishiness of the transaction, and I begged Mr. Knox not to put himself to this trouble on my account, as I had no doubt I could find a horse for my friend elsewhere. Mr. Knox assured me that it was no trouble at all, quite the contrary, and that, since his grandmother had given him the colt, he saw no reason why he should not take him when he wanted him. Also, that if I didn't want him, he'd be glad enough to keep him himself. And finally, uh, that I wasn't the chap to go back on a friend, but I was welcome to drive back to Shree Lane with Mytel this minute, if I liked. Of course, I yielded in the end. I told Flurry I should lose my job over the business, and he said I could then marry his grandmother. And the discussion was abruptly closed by the necessity of following Slipper over a locked, five-barred gate. Our pioneer took us over about half a mile of country, knocking down stone gaps where practicable, and scrambling over tall banks in the deceptive moonlight. We found ourselves at length in a field with a shed in one corner of it, in a dim group of farm buildings. A little way off, a light was shining. Wait here said Flurry to me in a whisper. The less noise, the better. It's an open shed, and we'll just uh, slip in and coax him out. Slipper unwound from his waist a halter, and my colleagues glided like spectres into the shadow of the shed, leaving me to meditate on my duties as resident magistrate and on the questions that would be asked in the house by our local member when Slipper had given away the adventure in his cups. In less than a minute, three shadows emerged from the shed where two had gone in. They had got the colt. He came out as quiet as a calf when he winded the sugar, said Flory. It was well for me I filled my pockets for my grandmama's sugar basin. He and Slipper had a rope from each side of the colt's head. They took him quickly across the field toward the gate. The colt stepped daintily between them over the moonlit grass. He snorted occasionally, but appeared on the whole amenable. The trouble began later, and was due, as trouble often is, to the beguilements of a short cut. Against the maturer judgment of Slipper, Flory insisted on following a route that he assured us he knew as well as his own pocket, and the consequence was that in about five minutes I found myself standing on top of a bank, hanging onto a rope, on the other end of which the colt dangled and danced while Flory, with the other rope, lay prone in the ditch, and Slipper administered to the bewildered colt's hindquarters such chastisement as could be ventured on. I have no space to narrate in detail the atrocious difficulties and disasters of the shortcut, how the colt set to work to buck and went away across a field, dragging the faithful slipper, literally vent à terre, after him, while I picked myself in ignominy out of a briar patch and flurry cursed him to the black in the face, how we were attacked by ferocious cur dogs, and I lost my eyeglass and how, as we neared the river's cross, Flurry espied the police patrol on the road, and we all hid behind a rick of turf. While I realised in fullness what an exceptional ass I was, 
to have been beguiled into an enterprise that involved hiding with Slipper from the Royal Irish Constabulary. Let it suffice to say that Trinket's infernal offspring was finally handed over on the high road to Michael and Slipper, and Flurry drove me home in a state of mental and physical overthrow. I saw nothing of my friend Mr. Knox for the next couple of days, by the end of which time I had worked up a high polish on my misgivings and had determined to tell him that under no circumstances would I have anything to say to his grandmother's birthday present. It was like my usual luck that, instead of writing a note to this effect, I thought it would be good for my liver to walk across the hills to Tory Cottage and tell Flurry so in person. It was a bright, blustery morning after a muggy day. The feeling of spring was in the air. The daffodils were already in bud, and crocuses showed purple in the grass on either side of the avenue. It was only a couple of miles to Tory Cottage, by the way, across the hills. I walked fast, and it was barely twelve o'clock when I saw its pink walls and clumps of evergreens below me. As I looked down at it, the chiming of Flurry's hounds in the kennels came to me on the wind. I stood still to listen, and could almost have sworn that I was hearing again the clash of modern bells hard at work on May morning. The path that I was following led downwards through a large plantation to Flurry's back gate. Hot wafts from some hideous cauldron at the other side of a wall apprised me of the vicinity of the kennels and their cuisine, and the fir trees round were hung with gruesome and unknown joints. I thanked heaven that I was not a master of hounds, and passed on as quickly as might be to the hall door. I rang two or three times without response. Then the door opened a couple of inches and was instantly slammed in my face. I heard the hurried paddling of bare feet and oil cloth, and a voice, Hurry, Bridgie, hurry! There's quality at the door. Bridgie, holding a dirty cap on with one hand, presently arrived and informed me that she believed Mr. Knox was out about the place. She seemed perturbed and she cast scared glances down the drive while speaking to me. I knew enough of Flurry's habits to shape a tolerably direct course for his whereabouts. He was, as I had expected, in the training paddock, a field behind the stable yard in which he had put up practice jumps for his horses. It was a good-sized field with clumps of furs in it, and Flurry was standing near one of these with his hands in his pockets, singularly unoccupied. I supposed that he was prospecting for a place to put up another jump. He did not see me coming, and turned with a start as I spoke to him. There was a queer expression of mingled guilt, and what I can only describe as divilment in his grey eyes as he greeted me. In my dealings with Flurry Knox, I have since formed the habit of sitting tight in a general way, when I see that expression. Well, who is coming next? I wonder, he said, as he shook hands with me. It's not ten minutes <laughs> since I had two of your damn peelers here searching the whole place for my grandmother's colt. What? I exclaimed, feeling cold all down my back. Do you mean... The police have got hold of it? They haven't got hold of the colt anyway, said Flurry, looking sideways at me from under the peak of his cap with the glint of the sun in his eye. I got word in time before they came. What do you mean? I demanded. Where is he? For heaven's sake, don't tell me you've sent the brute over to my place. It's a good job for you I didn't replied Flurry. As the police are on their way to Sri Lanka this minute to consult you about it, you, he gave utterance to one of his short diabolical fits of laughter, he swear they'll not find him anyhow. 
It's the funniest hand I ever played. Oh, yes. It's devilish funny, I've no doubt. I retorted, beginning to lose my temper, as is the manner of many people when they are frightened. But I give you a fair warning that if Mrs. Knox asks me any questions about it, I shall tell her the whole story. All right, responded Flurry. And when you do, don't forget to tell her how you flog the colt out onto the road over her own bounds ditch. Very well, I said hotly. I might as well go home and send in my papers. They'll break me over this. Hold on, Major, said Flurry soothingly. It'll be all right. No one knows anything. It's only on spec the old lady sent the bobbies here. If you'll keep quiet, it'll all blow over. I don't care, I said, struggling hopelessly in the toils. If I meet your grandmother and she asks me about it, I shall tell her all I know. Oh, please, God, you'll not meet her. After all, it's not once in a blue moon that she began Flurry, even as he said the words his face changed. Holy Flurry, he ejaculated. Isn't that her dog coming into the field? Look at her bonnet over the wall. Hide, hide for your life. He caught me by the shoulder and shoved me down among the furze bushes before I realized what had happened. Get in there. I'll talk to her. I may as well confess that at the mere sight of Mrs. Knox's purple bonnet, my heart had turned to water. In that moment, I knew what it would be like to tell her how I, having eaten her salmon and capped her quotations and drunk her best port, had gone forth and helped to steal her horse. I abandoned my dignity, my sense of honor. I took the furs, prickles to my breast, and wallowed in them. Mrs. Knox had advanced with vengeful speed. Already she was in high altercation with Flurry at no great distance from where I lay. Varying sounds of battle reached me, and I gathered that Flurry was not, to put it mildly, shrinking from that uh, economy of truth that the situation required. Is it that Kirby long backed brute? You promised him to me long ago, but I wouldn't be bothered with him. The old lady uttered a laugh of shrill derision. Is it likely I'd promise you my best coat and still more? Is it likely that you'd refuse him if I did? Very well, ma'am. Thorry's voice was admirably indignant. Then I suppose I'm a liar and a thief. I'd be more obliged to you for the information if I hadn't known it before responded his grandmother with lightning speed. If you were swore to me on a stack of Bibles you knew nothing about my coat, I wouldn't believe you. I shall go straight to Major Yates and ask his advice. I believe him to be a gentleman, in spite of the company he keeps. I writhed deeper into the firs bushes and thereby discovered a sandy rabbit run, along which I crawled with my cap well over my eyes and the fur's needles stabbing me through my stockings. The ground shelved a little, promising profounder concealment, but the bushes were very thick, and I laid hold of the bare stem of one to help my progress. It lifted out of the ground in my hand, revealing a freshly cut stump. Something snorted. Not a yard away. I glared through the opening and was confronted by the long, horrified face of Mrs. Knox's coat, mysteriously on a level with my own. Even without the white diamond on his forehead, I should have divined the truth. But how, in the name of wonder, had Flurry persuaded him to couch like a woodcock in the heart of a fur's break? For a full minute, I lay as still as death for fear of frightening him, while the voices of Flurry and his grandmother raged on alarmingly close to me. The colt snorted and blew long breaths through his wide nostrils, but he did not move. I crawled an inch or two nearer, 
and after a few seconds of cautious peering, I grasped the position. They had buried him. A small sand pit among the firs had been utilised as a grave. They had filled him in up to his withers with sand and a few furze bushes, artistically disposed around the pit, had done the rest. As the depth of Flurry's guile was revealed, laughter came upon me like a flood. I gurgled and shook apoplectically, and the colt gazed at me with serious surprise until a sudden outburst of barking close to my elbow administered a fresh shock to my tottering nerves. Mrs. Knox's woolly dog had tracked me into the furs and was now baying the colt and me with mingled terror and indignation. I addressed him in a whisper, with perfidious endearments, advancing a crafty hand towards him the while, made a snatch for the back of his neck, missed it badly, and got him by the ragged fleece of his hindquarters as he tried to flee. If I had fed him alive, he could hardly have uttered a more deafening series of yells, but, like a fool... Instead of letting him go, I dragged him towards me and tried to stifle the noise by holding his muzzle. The tussle lasted engrossingly for a few seconds, and then the climax of the nightmare arrived. Mrs. Knox's voice close behind me said, Let go my dog this instant, sir. Who are you? Her voice faded away, and I knew that she also had seen the colt's head. I positively felt sorry for her. At her age, there was no knowing what effect the shock might have on her. I scrambled to my feet and confronted her. Major Yates, she said. There was a deathly pause. Will you kindly tell me, said Mrs. Knox slowly, am I in Bedlam or are you? And what is that? She pointed to the colt, and that unfortunate animal, recognising the voice of his mistress, uttered a hoarse and lamentable whinny. Mrs. Knox felt around her for support, found only furs prickles, gazed speechlessly at me, and then, to her eternal honour, fell into wild cackles of laughter. So, I may say, did Flurry and I. I embarked on my explanation and broke down. Flurry followed suit and broke down too. Overwhelming laughter held us all three, disintegrating our very souls. Mrs. Knox pulled herself together first. I acquit you, Major Yates. I acquit you, though appearances are against you. It's clear enough to me. You've fallen among thieves. She stopped and glowered at Furry. Her purple bonnet was over one eye. I thank you, sir, she said, to dig out that horse before I leave this place, and when you've dug him out, you may keep him. I'll be no receiver of stolen goods. She broke off and shook her fist at him. Upon my conscience, Tony, I'd give a guinea to have thought of it myself. Chapter 4 The Waters of Strife I knew Bat Callahan's face long before I was able to put a name to it. There was seldom a court day in Scabon that I was not aware of his level brows and superfluously intense expression. Somewhere among the knot of corner boys who patronised the weekly sittings of the bench of magistrates. His social position appeared to fluctuate. I have seen him driving a car. He sometimes held my horse for me. That is to say, he sat on the counter of a public house while the Quaker slumbered in the gutter. And on one occasion, he retired at my bidding to Cork Jail, there to meditate upon the inadvisability of defending a friend from the attentions of the police with the tailboard of a cart. He next obtained prominence in my regard at regatta held under the auspices of the Sons of Liberty, a local football club that justified its title 
by the patriot green of its jerseys and its free interpretation of the rules of the game. The announcement of my name on the posters as a patron, a privilege acquired at the cost of a reluctant half-sovereign, made it incumbent on me to put in an appearance, even though the festival coincided with my petty sessions day at Skibon. And at some five of the clock on a brilliant September afternoon, I found myself driving down the stony road that dropped in zigzags to the borders of the lake on which the races were to come off. I believe that the selection of Loch Lonan as the scene of the regatta was not unconnected with the fact that the secretary of the club owned a public house at the crossroads at one end of it. Nonetheless, the president of the Royal Academy could scarcely have chosen more picturesque surroundings. A mountain towered steeply up from the lake's edge, dark with the sad green of beech trees in September. Fir woods followed the curve of the shore and leaned far over the answering darkness of the water. And above the trees rose the toppling steepnesses of the hill, painted with a purple glow of heather. The lake was about a mile long and, tumbling from its farther end, a fierce and narrow river fled away west to the sea some four or five miles off. I had not seen a boat race since I was at Oxford, and the words still called up before my eyes a vision of smart parasols, of gorgeous barges, of snowy-clad youths, and of low, slim outriggers, winged with the level flight of oars, slitting the water to the sway of the line of flat backs. Certainly, undreamed of possibilities in aquatics were revealed to me as I reigned in the Quaker on the outskirts of the crowd and saw below me the festival of the Sons of Liberty in full swing. Boats of all shapes and sizes, outrageously overladen, moved about the lake with oars flourishing to the strains of concertinas. Black swarms of people seethe along the water's edge, congesting here and there around the dingy tents and stalls of green apples, and the club's celebrated brass band, enthroned in a wagonette and stimulated by the presence of a barrel of porter on the box seat, was belching forth the boys of Wexford under the guidance of a disreputable ex-militia drummer in a series of crashing discords. Almost as I arrived, a pistol shot set the echoes clattering around the lake, and three boats burst out abreast from the throng into the open water. Two of the crews were in shirt sleeves. The third wore the green jerseys of the football club. The boats were of the heavy sea-going build and pulled six oars apiece, oars of which the looms were scarcely narrower than the blades and were of the two but a shade heavier. Nonetheless, the rowers started dauntlessly at 35 strokes a minute, quickening up, incredible as it may seem, as they rounded the boat in the first lap of the two-mile course. The rowing was, in general style, more akin to the action of beating up eggs with a fork than to any other form of athletic exercise. But in its unorthodox way, it kicked the heavy boats along at a surprising pace. The oars squeaked and grunted against the thole pins. The coxswains kept up an unceasing flow of oratory, and superfluous little boys in punts contrived to intervene at all the more critical turning points of the race, only evading the flail of the oncoming oars by performing prodigies of waggling with a single oar at the stern. I took out my watch and counted the strokes. When they were passing the mark boat for the second time, they were pulling a fraction over forty. One of the shirt sleeve crews was obviously in trouble. The other, with humped backs and jerking oars, was holding its own against the green jerseys amid the blended yells of friends and foes. When, for the last time, they rounded the green flag, there were but two boats in the race and the foul that had been imminent throughout was at length achieved with a rattle of oars and a storm of curses. They were clear again in a moment, the shirt sleeve crew getting away with a distinct lead. And it was at about this juncture that I became aware that the coxswains, 
had abandoned their long-handled tillers and were standing over their respective strokes, shoving frantically at their oars and maintaining the while a ceaseless ball of encouragement and defiance. It looked like a foregone conclusion for the leaders, and the war of cheers rose to frenzy. The word cheering, indeed, is but a euphemism, and in no way expresses the serrated yell composed of epithets, advice, and imprecations that was flung like a live thing at the oncoming boats. The green jerseys answered to this stimulant with a wild spurt that drove the bow of their boat within a measurable distance of their opponent's stroke oar. In another second, a thoroughly successful foul would have been effected. But the cox of the leading boat proved himself equal to the emergency by unshipping his tiller and with the dealing bow of the green jerseys such a blow over the head as effectually dismissed him from the sphere of practical politics. A great roar of laughter greeted this feat of arms, and a voice at my dogcart's wheel pierced the clamour. More power to ye, Larry, me old darling. I looked down and saw Bat Callahan, with shining eyes and a face white with excitement, poising himself on one foot on the box of my wheel in order to get a better view of the race. Almost before I had time to recognize him, a man in a green jersey caught him round the legs and jerked him down. Callahan fell into the throng, recovered himself in an instant, and rushed white and dangerous at his assailant. The son of liberty was no less ready for the fray, and what is known in Ireland as the father and mother of a row was imminent. Already, however, one of those unequal judges of the moral temperature of a crowd, a sergeant of the RIC, had quietly interposed his bulky person between the combatants, and the coming trouble was averted. Elsewhere, battle was raging. The race was over, and the committee boat was hemmed in by the rival crews, supplemented by craft of all kinds. The objection was being lodged, and in its turn objected to, and I can only liken the process to the screaming warfare of seagulls round a piece of carrion. The tumult was still at its height when, out of its very heart, two four-oared boats broke forth, and a pistol shot proclaimed that another race had begun. The public interest in which was especially keen, owing to the fact that the roars were stalwart country girls, who made up in energy what they lacked in skill. It was a short race, once round the mark boat only, and, like a successful farce, it went with a roar from start to finish. Foul after foul, each followed by a healing interval of calm, during which the crews, who had all caught crabs, were recovering themselves and their oars, marked its progress. And when the two boats, locked in an inextricable embrace, at length passed the winning flag, and the crews, oblivious of judges and public, fell to untrammeled personal abuse and to doing up their hair, I decided that I had seen the best of the fun and prepared to go home. It was, as it happened, the last race of the day, and nothing remained in the way of excitement save the greased pole with the pig slung in a bag at the end of it. My final impression of the Loch Lonan regatta was of Callaghan's lithe figure, sleek and dripping against the yellow sky, as he poised on the swaying pole with the broken gold of the water beneath him. Limited as was my experience of the southwest of Ireland, I was in no way surprised to hear on the following afternoon from Peter Cadogan that there had been strokes the night before when the boys were going home from the regatta and that the police were searching for one Jimmy Foley. What do they want him for? I asked. Sure, it's according as a man that was bringing a car of bogwood was telling me, sir, answered Peter pursuing his occupation of washing the dog cart with unabated industry. They say Jimmy's wife went roaring to the police, saying she could get no account of her husband. I suppose he's beaten some fellow and is hiding, I suggested. Well, that might be, sir, asserted Peter respectfully. 
He plied his mop vigorously in intricate places about the springs, which would, I knew, have never been explored save for my presence. It's what John Hennessy was saying, uh, that he was hard set to get his horse past Clue and Cross, the way the blood was strewn about the road, resumed Peter. Sure, they were fighting like wasps in it half the night. Who were fighting? I couldn't say, indeed, sir. Some of them low, rakish lads from the town, I suppose, replied Peter with virtuous respectability. When Peter Cadogan was quietly and intelligently candid, to pursue an inquiry was seldom of much avail. Next day in Scabon, I met little Murray, the district inspector, very alert and smart in his rifle-green uniform, going forth to collect evidence about the fight. He told me that the police were pretty certain that one of the Sons of Liberty, named Foley, had been murdered. But, as usual, the difficulty was to get anyone to give information. All that was known was that he was gone, and that his wife had identified his cap, which had been found drenched with blood by the roadside. Murray gave it as his opinion that the whole business had arisen out of the row over the disputed race, and that there must have been a dozen people looking on when the murder was done. But so far no evidence was forthcoming, and after a day and a night of search, the police had not been able to find the body. No, said Flurry Knox, who had joined us. And if it was any of those uh, mountainy men did away with him, you might scrape Ireland with a small tooth comb, and you'll not get him. That evening, I smoked an after-dinner cigarette out of doors in the mild starlight, strolling about the rudimentary paths of what would, I hoped, someday, be Philippa's garden. The bats came stooping at the red end of my cigarette, and from the covert behind the house I heard once or twice the delicate bark of a fox. Civilization seemed a thousand miles off, as far away as the falling star that had just drawn a line of pale fire halfway down the northern sky. I had been nearly a year at Tree Lane House by myself now, and the time seemed very long to me. It was slow work putting by money, even under the austerities of Mrs. Cadogan's regime, and though I had warned Philippa I meant to marry her after Christmas, there were moments, and this was one of them, when it seemed an idle threat. Peter! The strident voice of Mrs. Cadogan intruded upon my meditations. Go tell the Major his coffee is waiting on him. I went gloomily into the house, and with a resignation born of adversity, swallowed the mixture of chicory and licorice which my housekeeper possessed the secret of distilling from the best and most expensive coffee. My theory about it was that it added to the illusion that I had dined, and moreover, that it kept me awake, and I generally had a good deal of writing to do after dinner. Having swallowed it, I went downstairs and out past the kitchen regions to my office, a hideous, whitewashed room in which I interviewed policemen and took affidavits and did most of my official writing. It had a door that opened into the yard and a window that looked out in the other direction, among lanky laurels and scrubby hollies, where lay the cat's main thoroughfare from the scullery window to the rabbit holes in the wood. I had a good deal of work to do, and the time passed quickly. It was Friday night, and from the kitchen at the end of the passage came the gabbling murmur in two alternate keys that I had learned to recognize as the recital of a litany by my housekeeper and her nephew Peter. This performance was followed by some of those dreary and heart-rending yawns that are, I think, peculiar to Irish kitchens. Then such of the cats as I had returned from the chase were loudly shepherded into the back scullery. The kitchen door shut with a slam, and my retainers retired to repose. It was nearly an hour afterwards when I finished the notes I had been making on an adjourned case of stoke hauling salmon in the Lonan River. I leaned back in my chair and lighted a cigarette preparatory to turning in. My thoughts had again wandered on a sentimental journey across the Irish Channel 
and I heard a slight stir of some kind outside the open window. In the wilds of Ireland, no one troubles themselves about burglars. More cats, I thought. I must shut the window before I go to bed. Almost immediately, there followed a faint tap on the window, and then a voice said in a hoarse and hurried whisper, Them that wants Jim Foley, let them look in the river. If I had kept my head, I should have sat still and encouraged a further confidence. But unfortunately, I acted on the impulse of the natural man and was at the window in a jump, knocking down my chair and making noise enough to scare a far less shy bird than an Irish informer. Of course, there was no one there. I listened with every nerve as taut as a violent string. It was quite dark and there was just breeze enough to make a rustling of the evergreens so that a man might brush through them without being heard. And while I debated on a plan of action that came from beyond the shrubbery, the jar and twang of a loose strand of wire in the paling by the wood. My informant, whoever he might be, had vanished into the darkness from which he had come as irrecoverably as had the falling star that had written its brief message across the sky and gone out again into infinity. I got up very early next morning and drove to Skibon to see Murray and offer him my mysterious information for what it was worth. Personally, I did not think it worth much and was disposed to regard it as a red herring drawn across the trail. Murray, however, was not in a mood to despise anything that had a suggestion to make. Having been out till nine o'clock the night before, without being able to find any clue to the hiding place of James Foley. The river's a good mile from the place where the fight was, he said, straddling his compasses over the ordnance of map. And there's no sort of a road that could have taken him along, but a tip like this is always worth trying. I remember in the Land League time how a man came one Saturday night to my window and told me there were holes drilled in the chapel door to shoot a boycotted man through while he was at Mass. The holes were there right enough, and you may be quite sure that chap found excellent reasons for having family prayers at home next day. I had sessions to attend on the extreme outskirts of my district and could not wait, as Murray suggested, to see the thing out. I did not get home till the following day, and when I arrived, I found a letter from Murray awaiting me. Your pal was right. We found Foley's body in the river, knocking about against the posts of the weir. The head was wrapped in his own green jersey and had been smashed in by a stone. We suspect a fellow named Bat Callahan, who has bolted, but there were a lot of them in it. Possibly it was Callahan himself who gave you the tip. You never can tell how superstition is going to take them next. The inquest will be held tomorrow. The coroner's jury took a cautious view of the cause of the catastrophe and brought in a verdict of death by misadventure. And I presently found it to be my duty to call a magisterial inquiry to further investigate the matter. A few days before this was to take place, I was engaged in the delicate task of displaying to my landlord, Mr. Flurry Knox, the defects of the pantry sink when Mrs. Cadogan advanced upon us with the information that the widow Callaghan from Cloon would be thankful to speak to me and had brought me a present of a fine young goose. Is she come over looking for bat? said Flurry, withdrawing his arm and the longest kitchen skewer from the pipe that he had been probing. She knows you're handy at hiding your friends, Mary. Maybe it's he that's stopping the drain. Mrs. Cadogan turned her large red face upon her late employer. God knows. I wish yourself was stuck on it, Master Flurry. The way you'd hear Peter cursing the full of the house when he's striving to wash the things in that unnatural little trough. Are you sure it's uh, Peter does all the cursing? retorted Furry. 
I hear Father Scanlon has it in for you this long time for not going to confession. And how can I walk two miles to the chapel with God's burden on me feet? demanded Mrs. Cadogan in purple indignation. The Blessed Virgin and Dr. Hickey knows well the hardships I get from them, and if it wasn't for a pair of the Major's boots he gave me, I'd be hard set to travel the house itself. The contest might have been continued indefinitely, had I not struck up the swords with a request that Mrs. Callaghan might be sent round to the hall door. There we found a tall, grey-haired countrywoman waiting for us at the foot of the steps in the hooded blue cloak that is peculiar to the south of Ireland. From the fact that she touched a pocket handkerchief in her right hand, I augured a stormy interview. But nothing could have been more self-restrained and even imposing than the reverence with which she greeted Flurry and me. Good morning to your honours, she began with a dignified and extremely imminent snuffle. I ask your pardon for troubling you, Major Yates, but I haven't a one of the country to give me an advice, and I have no confidence only in your honour's experiments. Experience, she means, prompted very. Didn't you get advice enough out of Mr. Murray yesterday? He went on aloud. I heard he was a clown to see you. And if he was itself, it's little advantage anyone would get out of that little whippersnapper of a snap dragon, responded Mrs. Callaghan tartly. He was with me for half an hour, giving me every big rock of English till I had a reel in my head. I declare to ye, Mr. Flurry, after he had gone out of the house, he wouldn't throw three farthings for me. The pocket handkerchief was here utilised, out of which, with a heavy groan, Mrs. Callaghan again took up her parable. I told him first and last I'd lose me life if I had to go into the court. And if I did itself, so the attorneys could rip no more out of me than what he did himself. Did you tell him where was bad? inquired Flurry casually. At this, Mrs. Callaghan immediately dissolved into tears. Isn't it bad? she howled. If the twelve apostles came down from heaven asking me where was bad, I could give them no satisfaction. The devil and no I know what's happened to him. He came home with me, sober and good-natured, from the regatta, and the next morning he axed a fresh egg for his breakfast, and God forgive me. I wouldn't break the score I was taking to the hotel, and with that he slapped the cup of tea into the fire and went out the door, and I never got a word out of him since, good nor bad. God knows. Tis I got trouble with that poor boy, and he the only one I have to look to in the whole world. I cut the matter short by asking her what she wanted me to do for her, and sifted out from amongst much extraneous detail the fact that she relied upon my renowned wisdom and clemency to preserve her for being called as the witness of the coming inquiry. The gift of the goose served its intended purpose of embarrassing my position, but in spite of it, I broke to the widow Callaghan my inability to help her. She did not, of course, believe me, but she was too well-bred to say so. In Ireland, one becomes accustomed to this attitude. As it turned out, however, Bat Callaghan's mother had nothing to fear from the inquiry. She was by turns deaf, imbecile, garrulously candid and furiously abusive of Murray's principal witness, a frightened lad of seventeen who had sworn to having seen Bat Callaghan and Jimmy Foley shaping at one another to fight at an hour when, according to Mrs. Callaghan, Bat was lying stretched on the bed in with a sick stomach. In consequence of the malignant character of the porter supplied by the last witness's father. It all ended, as such cases often do in Ireland, in complete moral certainty in the minds of all concerned as to the guilt of the accused and entire impotence on the part of the law to prove it. A warrant was issued for the arrest of Bartholomew Callaghan, and the clans of Callaghan and Foley fought rather more bloodily than usual, as occasion served. And at intervals during the next few months, Murray used to ask me if my friend the murderer had dropped in lately, to which I was wont to reply with condolences 
on the failure of the RIC to find the widow Callahan's only son for her. And that was about all that came of it. Events with which the present story has no concern took me to England towards the end of the following March. It so happened that my old regiment, the Fusiliers, was quartered at Windcastle, within a couple of hours by rail of Philippa's home where I was staying. And since my wedding was now within measurable distance, my former brothers-in-arms invited me over to dine and sleep and to receive a valedictory silver claret jug that they were magnanimous enough to bestow upon a backslider. I enjoyed the dinner as much as any man can enjoy his dinner when he knows he has to make a speech at the end of it. Through much and varied conversation I strove, like a nervous mother who cannot trust her offspring out of her sight, to keep before my mind's eye the opening sentences that I had composed in the train. I felt that if I could only get away satisfactorily, I might trust the Ayala 89 to do the rest, and of that font of inspiration there was no lack. As it turned out, I got away all right, though the sight of the double line of expectant faces and red mess jackets nearly scattered those precious opening sentences, and I am afraid that so far as the various subsequent points went that I had intended to make, I stayed away. However, neither Demosthenes nor a nationalist member at a Cork election could have been listened to with more gratifying attention, and I sat down, hot and happy, to be confronted with my own flushed visage, hideously reflected in the glittering paunch of the claret jug. Once safely over the presentation, the evening mellowed into frivolity, and it was pretty late before I found myself settled down to whist at six many points in the ancient familiar way, while most of the others fell to playing pool in the billiard room next door. I had played whist from my youth up, with the preternatural seriousness of a subaltern, with the self-assurance of a senior captain, with the privileged irascibility of a major. And my 18 months of abstinence at Sri Lane had only whetted my appetite for what I considered the best of games. After the long, lonely evenings there with the rats for company and for relaxation, a deck of that specially demoniacal American variety of patients known as Fooley Anne, it was wondrous agreeable to sit again among my fellows and lay the longs on a scientific rubber of whist as though Mrs. Cadogan and the Scabon bench of magistrates had never existed. We were in the first game of the second rubber, and I was holding a very nice playing hand. I had early in the game moved forth my trumps to battle, and I was now in the ineffable position of scoring with the small cards of my long suit. The cards fell and fell in silence, and Ballantyne, my partner, raked in the tricks like a machine. The concentrated quiet of the game was suddenly arrested by a sharp, unmistakable sound from the barrackyard outside, the snap of a Lee Metford rifle. What was that? exclaimed Moffat, the senior major. Before he had finished speaking, there was a second shot. By Jove! Those were rifle shots. Perhaps I'd better go and see what's up, said Ballantyne, who was captain of the week, throwing down his cards and making a bolt for the door. He had hardly gone out of the room when the first long high note of the assembly sang out, sudden and clear. We all sprang to our feet, and as the bugle call went shrilly on, the other men came pouring in from the billiard room and stampeded to their quarters to get their swords. At the same moment, the mess sergeant appeared at the outer door with a face as white as his shirt front. The sentry on the magazine guard has been shot, sir, he said excitedly to Muffet. They say he's dead. We were all out in the barrack square in an instant. It was clear moonlight, and the square was already alive with hurrying figures cramming on clothes and caps as they ran to fall in. I was a free agent these times, and I followed the mess sergeant across the square towards the distant corner where the magazine stands. As we doubled round the end of the men's quarters, we nearly ran into a small party of men who were advancing slowly and heavily in our direction. Here he is, sir, said the mess sergeant, stopping himself abruptly. They were carrying the sentry to the hospital. 
His busby had fallen off. The moon shone mildly on his pale, convulsed face, and foam and strange inhuman sounds came from his lips. His head was rolling from side to side on the arm of the man who was carrying him. As it turned towards me, I was struck by something disturbingly familiar in the face, and I wondered if he had been in my old company. What's his name, Sergeant? I said to the mess sergeant. Private Harris, sir, replied the sergeant. He's only lately come off from the depot, and this was his first time on sentry by himself. I went back to the mess, and in process of time the others straggled in, thirsting for whiskies and sodas and full of such information as there was to give. Private Harris was not wounded. Both the shots had been fired by him, as was testified by the state of his rifle, and the fact that two of the cartridges were missing from the packet in his pouch. I hear he was a queer, sulky sort of chap always, said Tompkinson, the subaltern of the day, but if he was having a try at suicide, he made a belly bad fist of it. He made as good a fist of it as you did of putting on your sword, Tommy, remarked Ballantyne indicating a dangling white strap of webbing that hung down like a tail below Mr. Tompkinson's mess jacket. <laughs> Nerves, obviously, in both cases. The exquisite satisfaction afforded by this discovery to Mr. Tompkinson's brother officers found its natural outlet in a bear fight that threatened to become more or less general, and in the course of which I slid away unostentatiously to bed in Ballantyne's quarters and took the precaution of barricading my door. Next morning, when I got down to breakfast, I found Ballantyne and two or three others in the mess room, and my first inquiry was for Private Harris. Oh, the poor chap's dead, said Ballantyne. Very queer business altogether. I think he must have been wrong in the top story. The doctor was with him when he came to out of the fit, or whatever it was, and O'Reilly, that's the doctor, you know, Irish, of course. And, oh, by the way, poor Harris was an Irishman, too. Uh, says that he could only gibber at first, but then he got it out of him that when he had been on sentry go for about half an hour, he happened to look up at the angle of the barrack wall near where it joins the magazine tower and saw a face looking at him over it. He challenged and got no answer. But the face just stuck there, staring at him. He challenged again, and then, as O'Reilly said, he just ooped with his rifle and blazed at it. Ballantyne was not above the common English delusion that he could imitate an Irish brogue. Well, what happened then? Well, according to the poor devil's own story, uh, the face just kept on looking at him, and he had another shot at it, and, uh, my God almighty, he said to O'Reilly, it was there always. While he was saying that to O'Reilly, he began to chuck another fit and apparently went on chucking them till he died a couple of hours ago. One result of it is, said another man, that they couldn't get a man to go on sentry there alone last night. I expect we shall have to double the sentries there every night, as long as we're here. Silly asses, remarked Tompkinson but he said it without conviction. After breakfast, we went out to look at the wall by the magazine. It was about 11 feet high, with a coped top, and they told me there was a deep and wide dry ditch on the outside. A ladder was brought, and we examined the angle of the wall at which Harris said the face had appeared. He had made a beautiful shot. One of his bullets, having flicked a piece off the ridge of the coping, exactly at the corner, it's not the kind of shot a man would make if he had been drinking, said Moffat, regretfully abandoning his first simple hypothesis. He must have been mad. I wish I could find out who his people are, said Brownlow, the adjutant who had joined us. They found in his box a letter to him from his mother, but we can't make out the name of the place. By Jove, Yates, you're an Irishman. Perhaps you can help us. He handed me a letter in a dirty envelope. There was no address given. The contents were very short. And I may be forgiven if I transcribed them. 
My dear son, I hope you are well, as this leaves me at present. Thanks be to God for it. I am very much uneasy about the cow. She swelled up this morning. She ran in and was frothing, and I did not do but to run up for Tom Sweeney in the minute. We are thinking it is too much lols or herbs she took. I do not know what I will do with her. God help one that's alone with himself. I had not a day's luck since you went away. I'm thinking them that wants you is tired looking for you. And so I remain your fond mother. Well, you don't get much of a lead from the car, do you? What the deuce is an Arab? said Brownlow. It's another way of spelling herb, I said, turning over the envelope abstractedly. The postmark was almost obliterated, but it struck me it might be construed into the word skibon. Look here, I said suddenly. Let me see Harris. It's just possible I may know something about him. The sentry's body had been laid in the dead house near the hospital, and Brownlow fetched the key. It was a grim little whitewashed building without windows, save a small one of lancet shape high up in one gable through which a streak of April sunlight fell sharp and slender on the whitewashed wall. The long figure of the sentry lay sheeted on a stone slab, and Brownlow, with his cap in his hand, gently uncovered the face. I leaned over and looked at it, at the heavy brows, the short nose, the small moustache lying black above the pale mouth, the deep-set eyes sealed in appalling peacefulness. There rose before me the wild, dark face of the young man who had hung on my wheel and yelled encouragement to the winning coxswain at the Loch Lonan Regatta. I know him, I said. His name is Callaghan. 